This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Every individual man or woman is the manager and chief executive of one of the most amazing organizations on Earth, the complex of body, mind, and spirit which constitute the human organism an assemblage of 639 separate muscles and 222 separate bones, each of which is so tough it can bear three times more weight than granite rock can without cracking or crumbling. But most importantly of all, each individual is unique. Just as mathematicians have found that the 52 playing cards in a deck can be arranged or shuffled into literally trillions and trillions of different combinations, so likewise are there virtually unnumberable varieties of ways in which the special talents, insights, abilities, and strong points of any individual man or woman can be reordered and so structured as to apply to a vast diversity of problems or situations, and to begin to utilize the full spectrum of one's incredible, God-given human potentials is an intriguing, absorbing, and exhilarating challenge. An 80-year-old Swiss writer once decided to calculate and itemize all the activities of his lifetime. Among his findings were these, that he had spent nearly 27 years just sleeping, six years eating, 228 days shaving, 21 years working, over five years waiting for people, and nearly two solid weeks just keeping his pipe lit. A human lifetime is composed of two elements, time and energy. But it is in the mind and in the inner life, in the domains of psychology, philosophy, and religion, that the individual determines how these two aspects of time and energy, which are your human lifetime, are to be consumed. William Gladstone, four times Prime Minister of Britain, spoke these words in a speech to school children in 1877. Be inspired with the belief that life is a great and noble calling, not a mean and groveling thing that we are to shuffle through as we can, but an elevated and lofty destiny. In that attitude lie the seeds of human greatness, for God created human beings to live in vital and dynamic faith and hope. But in order for there to be effective achievement in the outer life, there must be kinetic motivation in the inner life, and thus the vast importance of a psychologically sound spiritual philosophy of life. First of all, begin by considering some of the practical standards and criteria of effective day-by-day -day lifestyle management and applied psychology. The American Mental Health Association has compiled a list of nine traits or qualities which doctors agree are the basic essentials for good mental health. Number one, a tolerant and easygoing attitude both toward yourself and toward others. Number two, a realistic estimation of your own personal abilities combined with a deep determination to make the most of them. Number three, self-respect and a personal pride in accomplishment, a self-respect independent of the judgment of other people. Number four, the ability to handle disappointment, to take it in stride without giving up. Number five, the ability to love and unselfishly to consider the interests of other people. Six, the ability to feel that you're part of the group and with a clear sense of your responsibility to the others in the group. Seven, an ability to solve problems as they arise without constantly procrastinating and putting off dealing with them until tomorrow or next week. Number eight, the ability to plan ahead and set realistic goals and the ability to think about the future without worrying about it. Forethought without distraught consternation. And finally, number nine, putting your best into whatever you're doing and permitting yourself to enjoy the satisfaction of accomplishing tasks. For in the words of the philosopher Goethe, there is no happiness without wise effort. The cultivation of these nine traits or qualities of mental health in liaison with an affirmative and forward-looking spiritual philosophy of life will release an entire series of new discoveries in the realms of one's God-given human potentials. The map draftsmen and chart makers believe that there are still portions of the open oceans and the seas where no ships have ever sailed, and with reefs and entire islands which have never in known human history been thoroughly mapped. And so it is similarly with the human mind and the human psychology. Each possesses fascinating, undiscovered potentials, all of which were best summarized by the greatest teacher in human history, who declared the kingdom of God is within you. A spark of divinity and ember of eternity 
indwells the mortal mind. And these human potentials are so inestimably great that one must never assume that the failings and pains of existence will annihilate them. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that an inconvenience, rightly considered, is an adventure. And whether one sees a difficulty as an adventure or as an inconvenience is strictly a matter of choice, philosophy, and perspective. But to become intrigued by the adventure of solving your daily problems can be a source both of interest and actual enjoyment. The psychologist Dr. Gardner Murphy described the psychologically healthy personality as, quote, one which utilizes effectively and without conflict all that it possesses. This intriguing adventure of utilizing the full extent of your intellectual, social, physical, emotional, and spiritual resources as a son or daughter of God is vital to exuberant living. Another aspect is an attitude of affirmative expectation. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor, wrote, When one door closes, another door opens. But we so often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which are opening before us. The living God has a plan and purpose for your human life, and the greatest adventure of all is seeking and finding and accomplishing that purpose. But what of the argument that the older one becomes, the less capable one becomes of learning new systems of behavior? Consider the research of Professor Thorndike of the New York Teachers College, who divided a group of 465 adults into three sections, making the division solely on the basis of age. In the first group, he placed youngsters still in their 20s. In the second, men and women in their 30s. And in the third group, people between 40 and 50. If all these groups were given the same tests, which group would show the greatest learning ability? The result, the group between 40 and 50 came out first in every test which was given, one of the most difficult of which was learning to write with the wrong hand. They even scored better than eight-year-olds at learning new patterns. Professor Thorndike then summarized the result of his investigation with these words. We have discovered that mature people can learn practically anything they want to. In every mental function, they are thoroughly plastic and teachable. In fact, the learning ability of older people is very nearly as great as the learning ability of young people at the highly favorable ages of 17, 18, and 19. End of quote. The knowledge that continuous learning and growth are possible is a tremendous stimulus to enthusiastic living in every pursuit of existence. And even death is but a momentary transition in an endless adventure of personal, spiritual discovery and growth. Creativity, too, is by no means the exclusive commodity of energetic youth. The U.S. Patent Office did a study to find during which decade of their lives most inventors developed the majority of their patents and completed the majority of their inventions. The answer? Between the ages of 60 and 70. And the psychological momentum achieved by the sheer expectation of such future creativity is in itself a tonic to the mind and spirit. But the greatest stimulus to vital living is the spiritual quest for perfection, aligning and synchronizing the human mind with the divine plan of the ages within the mind of God. One central issue for any psychologically healthy individual is that of self-identity. Dr. James F. T. Bugental of Stanford Research Institute once conducted a psychological study in quest of the one question which would reveal more about an individual personality than any other question. When his studies were completed, tabulated, and analyzed, it was found that the most revealing question which could be asked an individual consisted of the following three words, who are you? Dr. Bugental found that most individuals defined themselves in terms of what they do rather than in terms of who they are. In psychological field tests, the doctor and his associates at Stanford Research discovered that this three-word question, who are you, often induced novel self-scrutiny and elicited uncensored responses. Here are some examples. One man said, I'm married. I'm an insurance adjuster. A lady in a drugstore replied to the question, who are you, by saying, are you out of your mind of all the oddball questions I ever heard of? You're wasting your time with me. I have no intention of answering. The whole thing is ridiculous. A man at a filling station said, I'm a stockbroker, and well, let's see, I'm a Democrat, and I'm president of two civic organizations. A woman waiting for a bus replied, I guess I'm me. That's who I am. Who else? You're not putting me on, are you? You're really university investigators making a psychology survey? Okay, then. I'm supposed to give three answers to the question, who am I? 
Well, number two, I'm a housewife. Number three, I have three children and a husband who's an engineer. Note, she described herself first as herself, secondly, by what she did, and thirdly, by what her husband did. A man in a grocery store answered, Who am I? Is that a serious question? I don't know who I am. Who does? I'm a frustrated fragment of humanity, he said. I'm also a bookkeeper. I have two children, a wife, and two mortgages. Dr. Bugentel's study emphasized the essential task of coming to terms with oneself. But the highest possible definition or understanding of the self is as a son or daughter of the living God a brother or a sister to every other person on this planet. One therapist has written, most of us are like snowflakes trying to be like each other, yet knowing that no two snowflakes are ever identical. If we were to devote the same amount of energy in trying to discover the true self that lies buried deep within our own natures, we would all work harmoniously with life instead of forever fighting it and struggling against it. End of quote. Psychologists advise, in assessing yourself, give an honest appraisal of your particularly unique aspects of personality and behavior, and seek to define yourself not merely in terms of what you do, but of who you are. Consider well that genetically and in personality, background, and experiences, there is not another individual identical to you or to any of us on earth. Enter into the stimulating experience of studying the great thinkers and what they thought about human nature and destiny. For without this sort of transcendent spiritual perspective, one cannot ascend to the vision of life which has characterized the greatest of the men and women who have lived. The ceaseless explorations of science, philosophy, and religion are marvelous satisfactions to the mind and soul. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.